Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad to have you with us tonight. We are working our way through the book of Exodus. We are getting near the end of this book and tonight we're in chapter 36. So we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Exodus chapter 36. We'll be there in just a little bit. As always, if you have any questions about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send a message to me at info at Four Lakes church.org. You can also call or send a text to 608-224-0274 and we would love to hear from you. But as I said, tonight we are back to the book of Exodus. God's people are now free from their slavery in Egypt. They are getting ready to leave Mount Sinai, but before they do, they're going to need to build the tabernacle and that's pretty much where we are tonight. Last week, God tells Moses to collect a free will offering for the supplies that will be needed for the construction process and that brings us to the beginning of chapter 36. So the first paragraph is Exodus chapter 36 verses 1 through 7. Exodus chapter 36 verses 1 through 7. Now Bezalel and Aholiab and every skillful person in whom the Lord has put skill and understanding to know how to perform all the work in the construction of the sanctuary shall perform in accordance with all that the Lord has commanded. Then Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab and every skillful person in whom the Lord had put skill, everyone whose heart stirred him to come to the work to perform it. They received from Moses all the contributions which the sons of Israel had brought to perform the work in the construction of the sanctuary, and they still continued bringing to him free will offerings every morning. And all the skillful men who were performing all the work of the sanctuary came, each from the work which he was performing. And they said to Moses, The people are bringing much more than enough for the construction work which the Lord commanded us to perform. So Moses issued a command, and a proclamation was circulated throughout the camp, saying, Let no man or woman any longer perform work for the contributions of the sanctuary. Thus the people were restrained from bringing any more, for the material they had was sufficient and more than enough for all the work to perform it. Well, up there in verse 1, the two men who were given special talent and insight and wisdom in constructing the tabernacle, as we learned in last week's passage, they are now called upon to get to work. And notice Moses also now opens it up, I would say, basically to volunteers, to anyone whose heart was stirred to do this work. And meanwhile, the people have responded very well to that uh, call for a free will contribution. Those offerings are actually pouring in every morning continually. So the skilled workers, they get started. They realize that they actually have more than enough to get the job done. So they tell Moses, and Moses actually has the command, uh, has to give the command to stop giving. And one thing I noticed here, kind of before we get into what this actually means, is that they circulated this proclamation throughout the camp. And I've no, through the last few months, I've kind of wondered, do they get everybody together? Obviously, they don't have a PA system. So exactly how do they communicate to such a large group? They obviously couldn't print it. The printing press hadn't been invented yet. So here we see that they circulate it. So they pass the word along. And so the command goes out, please no longer give to the Lord. We have too much. And uh, that is so rare, isn't it? It's a great thing to see. And I believe that this might happen at the construction of uh, Solomon's tabernacle. They pretty much had everything together there as well. Uh, but the people were honored to participate in this project. And so they gave and they gave and they gave some more and they gave even more than what was actually needed. And remember, these donations are most likely coming from what they were given from their neighbors back in Egypt. If you remember on their way out of Egypt, um, God moved the hearts of the Egyptians to basically pay them back for the years of slave labor that they had put in. And they asked their neighbors, hey, can I have this, this, and this? And their neighbor said, sure, take it. And so I'm assuming that a lot of these donations are most likely coming from there. And so as Jesus once said, freely you received, freely give. And that principle definitely continues to apply today. What we have, what we think is our own, is actually not our own. Uh, what we have today is actually belonging to God. And it is our great honor, it is our privilege uh, to give part of what we have back to the Lord. But here in Exodus 36, as they get started on the construction of the tabernacle, Moses has to tell the people to stop. Stop giving. You guys are giving too much. And I'm guessing this could actually be quite the problem if we think about it. 
if you are constructing a building uh, and get overwhelmed with supplies, you might actually need to shift away from the building of the building to the management of the supplies. And uh, the piles of stuff would actually get in the way. I'm kind of thinking of what sometimes happens if there's an earthquake or a, a fire or a big storm, a hurricane or tornado somewhere, uh, people will send clothing. Well, a lot of times uh, you get overwhelmed with that. And then you start dealing with the clothing and those donations instead of actually rebuilding what needs to be rebuilt. And that becomes more of a distraction. And so a lot of times uh, it's actually cash that would help once they get over that initial shock. Um, but the point is um, they have more than enough at this point, And Moses actually has to tell the people to stop giving. And uh, whenever I read this, I think back to when we were receiving outside support from the church down in Goodlettsville, Tennessee. They were providing roughly uh, half of my salary at one point many years ago but through the years as the church here began to grow uh, you guys took more and more uh, of our outside support or uh, onto yourselves and so we kind of shifted that away from outsiders to uh, Four Lakes providing it all and so there were several times through the years where we had to get in touch with the elders down in Tennessee and uh, ask them to send less and uh, that is such a great call to be able to make. You know, at one point they were sending a little over $1,100 a month, and then we dropped that down to $900, and then $700, and then $500. And eventually we asked them just to uh, stop sending funds altogether. And I know some up here kind of made the suggestion, well, um, if they're willing to send it, let them send it. And so we talked about that a little bit, but uh, I think the congregation wisely concluded uh, that there is a value to stepping out on their on our own. And uh, there are other churches who need that help more than we do. And I just think of this personally when we hear Moses commanding the people to stop giving. Um, I remember when I called the elders down there and asked them to uh, make that very first reduction. Can you please drop it by a few hundred a month? Um, there was kind of a pause on the other end, and they said, we have never had anybody make that call before. Nobody has ever asked us to send less money. And it did feel good to do that. But I think about that when Moses has to command the people to stop giving, that they have plenty of what they need. Uh, as we come to the rest of this chapter, as we get ready to move into it, I want to just give you kind of a heads up that we're going to move rather quickly through this. Uh, the rest of the chapter has some pretty limited practical value, in my opinion. Uh, we basically have just like this running commentary on the building of the uh, tabernacle. And it'll actually continue over the next couple chapters, but it's in the Bible. So we want to read these paragraphs that are coming and then maybe make a few very brief comments as we move through this. But we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on the rest of the chapter. So let's continue then with Exodus 36 verses 8 through 13. The next paragraph, Exodus 36, 8 through 13. All the skillful men among those who were performing the work made the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twisted linen and blue and purple and scarlet material with cherubim, the work of a skillful workman. Bezalel made them. The length of each curtain was 28 cubits and the width of each curtain four cubits. All the curtains had the same measurements. He joined five curtains to one another, and the other five curtains he joined to one another. He made loops of blue on the edge of the outermost curtain in the first set. He did likewise on the edge of the curtain that was outermost on the second set. He made 50 loops in the one curtain, and he made 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that was in the second set. The loops were opposite each other. He made 50 clasps of gold and joined the curtains to one another with the clasps so that the tabernacle was a unit. So basically all we have, the uh, workers, the skilled workers are getting to work here. They're making the curtains that go around the outside and kind of over the top woven in with the designs that God had instructed along with the loops. And of course the goal here is to build the tabernacle in the way that it could be set up and then taken down rather quickly. And it was to be a portable building. It was to be not a permanent structure, but a tent. And it was to be carried with the people through the wilderness. So it's a giant tent, uh, but of course most of it was covered in gold. It would have been quite heavy, and so they kind of broke it down into smaller sections. So let's continue with Exodus 36, verses 14 through 19. Exodus 36, 14 through 19. Then he made curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the tabernacle. He made 11 curtains in all. The length of each curtain was 30 cubits and four cubits the width of each curtain. The 11 curtains had the same measurements. He joined the five curtains by themselves and the other six curtains by themselves. Moreover, he made 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that was the outermost 
in the first set. And he made 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that was outermost in the second set. He made 50 clasps of bronze to join the tent together so that it would be a unit. He made a covering for the tent of ram skins dyed red and a covering of porpoise skins above. So we now come to the covering for the tabernacle. And I think this is the one that goes over the top, constructed of goat's hair, uh, probably woven together and then covered on top and the outside with porpoise skins. And a couple months ago, someone was asking about the porpoise skins. And I can't remember who that was. If uh, uh, I think maybe a couple people did. There might have been somebody in my own family. And then I think somebody pulled me aside at church. Where in the world did they get porpoise skins in the middle of the wilderness? Well, um, a, a porpoise is a dolphin-like creature, isn't it? Kind of looked that up this afternoon just to verify. But uh, there is some uncertainty, though as to exactly how to translate this word from Hebrew into modern English. So we've got the, like the time factor going on. It's, it's an ancient thing. So this is 14 plus hundred years before the Lord. And now we're 2000 plus on the other side. Um, and so there's some uncertainty as to the translation and the interpretation of this. The English Standard Version, for example, I think translates this as goat skins. So if you're reading in the ESV, I'm reading from the New American Standard here. I've got porpoise skins. You've got goat skins. Um, I think I looked up the NIV earlier today, and I think that it said something like sea cows. So sea cows and uh, porpoises or, you know, it, it got a few things going on here. So it's kind of imprecise. So that's kind of our first problem. You know, I don't know where they got these creatures if we don't even know what the creatures are or were or if we even have this kind of creature even around today. But even if we go with porpoise skins, where do they get porpoises? Let's say it's a porpoise, where do they get those? Uh, well, you know, obviously, as they were crossing through the middle of the Red Sea on dry ground, um, they must have just reached into the walls of water and pulled out some porpoises. I have no idea if that's what they did. Um, or more accurately, I, I guess I have several ideas as to some possibilities here. Um, okay, maybe they went fishing in the Red Sea, kind of wrestling porpoises through the wall of water. I don't know. Uh, another possibility is that they did pick up some of these creatures as they traveled around the Red Sea. Uh, maybe they did some hunting and eating of that meat, and maybe they saved those skins as they were traveling. Uh, another possibility is that they were given these skins by their Egyptian neighbors. And so maybe these skins were highly valued as coverings, kind of raincoats, outer garments for the Egyptians. And maybe on their way out, when they asked their neighbors for things, maybe these were given to them. And so maybe they didn't capture or kill these porpoises. Maybe they just brought the skins with them from Egypt. Uh, another possibility is that when God said, cover this thing with porpoise skins, uh, they looked around and said, well, we're fresh out of porpoise skins. We don't have that. And so maybe they sent a porpoise hunting team uh, to the nearest large body of water to harvest those, uh, even traveling a few hundred miles. We just don't know, ultimately. Uh, but we do know that they got this done, whatever these skins were. If you have any other ideas or more theories on that, let me know. Uh, maybe God rained porpoises from above like he did with the manna and the quail. Um, but let's continue tonight with Exodus 36, verses 20 through 30. The next little paragraph here. Exodus 36, 20 through 30. Then he made the boards for the tabernacle of acacia wood standing upright. Ten cubits was the length of each board and one and a half cubits the width of each board. There were two tenons for each board fitted to one another. Thus he did for all the boards of the tabernacle. He made the boards for the tabernacle, 20 boards for the south side, and he made 40 sockets of silver under the 20 boards, two sockets under one board for its two tenons and two sockets under another board for its two tenons. Then for the second side of the tabernacle on the north side, he made 20 boards and there are 40 sockets of silver, two sockets under one board and two sockets under another board. For the rear of the tabernacle to the west, he made six boards. He made two boards for the corners of the tabernacle at the rear. Uh, they were double beneath and together they were complete to its top to the first ring. Thus he did with both of them for the two corners. There were eight boards with their sockets of silver, 16 sockets, two under every board. So again, it's not just uh, brimming with practical material here, but we transition to the metal and the woodworking part of the tabernacle. And as always, what surprises me when I read a paragraph like this 
is that they're doing this in the middle of the wilderness. Um, you know, no table saws, no miter saws, no modern equipment, uh, no safety gear to speak of, but they get it done. And if you do the calculations here with a cubit being 18 inches or the distance from a man's elbow to the tips of his fingers, those boards up in verse 20 were 27 inches wide by 18 feet long. Those are some huge boards. I mean, if God were to come down and tell me to make a board 27 inches wide by 18 feet long today, I would have a problem with that. Um, I mean, you couldn't find a board that straight <laughs> at a lot of our suppliers around here. So maybe you'd have to join things together. And I mean, I've got a table saw and router and uh, miter, you know, compound sliding miter saws. And, and, I, and I would have a hard time uh, creating a board. Um, 27 inches wide by 18 feet long. I mean that, and we don't know how thick that was, if that was two inches thick or one inch or whatever. That's a heavy board right there. And then you've got the tenons and you know, these like protrusions sticking out to join it. And th this is a complex project, especially without the tools that we have today. So some huge boards and they all had to fit together with the tenons and the sockets. And there were many of these. So I'm just uh, pointing out that this was a pretty big deal. So let's close tonight with the last little paragraph here, Exodus 36, verses 31 through 38. Exodus 36, 31 through 38. Then he made bars of acacia wood, five for the boards of one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards on the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the tabernacle for the rear side to the west. He made the middle bar to pass through in the center of the boards from end to end, he overlaid the boards with gold and made their rings of gold as holders for the bars and overlaid the bars with gold. Moreover, he made the veil of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. He made it with cherubim, the work of a skillful workman. He made four pillars of acacia for it and overlaid them with gold, with their hooks of gold, and he cast four sockets of silver for them. He made a screen for the doorway of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen, the work of a weaver. And he made its five pillars with their hooks, and he overlaid their tops and their bands with gold, but their five sockets were of bronze. Well, here at the end, we have the bars in verses 31, 32, and 33, and these bars are apparently intended to hold everything together. So they go through the center of those boards. I don't know if there was a hole in the middle or if this was the rings. Oh, but basically the bars keep everything connected. They keep everything aligned properly, which would be hard uh, over a 40 year period to keep a building like this straight as you were uh, putting it up and taking it down over and over again and moving it through the wilderness being carried by people. And then starting in verse 35, we get back to the weaving of some very ornate fabric. And this seems to be intended for use as a, a door uh, as a covering over the doorway, a very thick, uh, very luxurious curtain with some uh, precious material woven in there. And they construct pillars and a system of hooks and sockets uh, to make all of this uh, functional. Well, that brings us to the end of Exodus chapter 36. And next week, we hope to cover Exodus chapter 37, where they make some of the furniture that goes inside the tabernacle. And I've been looking into where to go next after the book of Exodus. If you have any ideas, I would love your input. Uh, so I've got a few ideas. And if, if there's something that you really think that we need to cover in our Wednesday evening class, let me know. And I'd love to uh, consider that. And if not immediately, maybe we could do that, uh, maybe the class after the next one. But I need your input on there. I'd appreciate it. But thank you for joining us tonight. Again, if you have any questions, any comments about tonight's class, if there's some way we can help, if there's something we can do to encourage you, if there's something we need to be praying about together as a church, get in touch. Uh, send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also send a text or give me a call at 608-224-0274, and we'd love to hear from you. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight because you are the one and only God, deserving of all praise and all honor. You are a God who hears our prayers and a God who listens to our concerns. Tonight, we're thankful that you've made us a part of your kingdom, the church. And tonight, we're especially thankful for those who join us online or on the phone, some from far off places, some people we've never met before. 
And so, Father, we pray tonight that you'll bless them wherever they are, that you would protect them from any spiritual harm, and we pray for blessings on all those who have looked at your word with us tonight. Our Father in heaven, we love you, and we come to you tonight in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.